It is now? Oh, it's on now. I'll try not to raise my voice because I can do that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. You're here today for Wandering and Elopement, and we'll talk about some strategies and the risk factors that go along with Wandering and Elopement. Now, since we're being recorded, I'll kind of stay over this way. So if you guys right there have any questions, it's going to be very difficult for me to see you because I'm getting a, a glare from the lights on my glasses and so... The agenda today's, for today's training is we're going to look at why you need a safety plan, um, acknowledging autism, and that's just going to look at the different icons and things that are out there that people will see and say, oh yeah, that's an autism awareness decal or something like that. And then uh, we'll look at different identification options so individuals will be able to identify themselves, even if they're nonverbal, could be through non-permanent tattoos or any of those types of things. There's some emergency contact forms that it's important for parents and even classroom teachers to have that are filled with all kinds of information about the kids and it can even be accompanied with a picture. And then when to call 911 and the call centers in the different areas. Why do you need a safety plan? Well, obvious reasons, it's to ensure safety. So we make sure that we have all the strategies and all of those little tips for a babysitter or anyone so that we have our safety plan in place so that the wandering alone can be addressed through that prior to it happening. It's going to lower the risk of any unintentional injury or wandering alone incidents. We want to have a safety plan because we want to be proactive instead of reactive. So you want the plan in place of what you would do in the event of a wandering and elopement emergency, because as a parent myself, when wandering happened, I was not of the mindset to know where my son would go in Walmart if he wandered away. I found out the day he wandered away in Walmart. So he went to the VHS tapes, because this has been a while. He's 28, he was turned 28 on Tuesday, so. Uh, and so he would go to the VHS taped section in the back of Walmart, and he would have all the videotapes pulled out, Barney, you name it, Rugrats, or he would be in the snack aisle looking at all the pretzels because that's a wall of pretzels. So that is where he was actually found the first time he wandered away from me in a public place. And I say that because there's other times he's wandered away from the home. You want to make sure you prepare a handout. It's going to have information on it such as the different types of behaviors that they could exhibit, um, if they've got, you know, color their hair, a physical description of them, and then any tips suggestions for how to redirect them, if it, you can do it verbally. I have a friend whose older son is, he loves sports, it doesn't matter what sport it is, he could always redirect him by saying, so, what are the, what is that football team, what are the um, dolphins doing? And he could stop whatever behavior he was having and turn right around and just start talking about the dolphins and what they were doing. You know who this is, Carolyn. And then how to develop the safety plan. You want to look at the, the safety measures you have installed in your home, and if you don't, then you want to look at what safety measures you could take in the home, because we want to keep them in. Right, you're not allowed to have anything to inhibit getting out of the classroom. Now, that may be great for you because you know that it was there, but a substitute might not know that, and if she's upset or heightened state of arousal as far as her emotions, she wouldn't know to look for something like that. So it would keep them in in the event of a fire alarm or something like that. So that's why they don't want you to put anything on the doors to keep them in. However, you can put an alarm on a door so that it would sound off and let them know that the door has been open. So wandering and elopement concerns, it's a primary issue for families who have kids with autism and other developmental disabilities. Yes, other individuals, Down syndrome, intellectual disability, if your kids are diagnosed with those disabilities, they will also have the propensity to wander. Primarily, kids with autism are our biggest engagers in a wandering and elopement behavior. What are the safety risks associated with that? Well, we're in Florida. There's lots of water here. So the primary risk is drowning, traffic, 
lots of people everywhere driving fast, maybe distracted drivers. Look down for a second, there could be a child with autism in front of you in the road. So traffic is a secondary concern. Then there's other environmental conditions. Now, we do have a lot of water here. One of the environmental conditions that we have in Florida is there's lots of creepy crawlies in the waterways. So whether it's a snake or if it might be an alligator, those are other issues that might come along with, even if the child knows how to swim. If they fall into a body of water, those skills that they learned in swimming may not come back to them. If they're shocked because they're walking in a canal and the bottom drops away, again, they could be shocked and not be able to access those skills they learned in swimming. And then when those, if, aside from that, if they do swim, again, we've got the, the alligators and things like that that can get them. We also have a lot of uh, indigenous plants that could be poisonous, so there's issues as far as that as well. And that oftentimes, the first time a child wanders, or at any time when they wander, it could be their first contact with law enforcement. So what we want to do to, in the, the planning stages, is get them familiar with law enforcement and let them understand that law enforcement is there to help them so that they don't run from law enforcement. Um, law enforcement officers are trained to recognize certain behaviors as it could be, okay, it looks like they're, they're kind of walking weird or they're not paying attention and they've got shifty eye gazing, so they'll think they're, being, they're trying to hide something. They might be drunk or on drugs. So we want to teach our kids not to run from the police. I know there's a lot of things going on in the news lately about law enforcement, but we want to teach our kids not to run because that could be detrimental to their safety. The child does not have to have any history of wandering or eloping from a situation. It could be the safety of your own home. They just want to see what's on the outside. My son was five years old the first time he wandered away from the home. Kind of a bittersweet moment. That is also the day I found out that all that OT therapy was actually working. He was able to open the deadbolt as well as turn the little lock on the door handle. So he was able to get out of the home. My daughter comes running into the back bedroom where I was on the phone putting laundry away. She says, where's Ian? In the living room. Nope, he's not. He had wandered out of the house. Lucky for us, we lived on a busy street, but he went to the right and went into the apartment courtyard instead of to the busy street. And when I get caught up to him and I called his name very sternly, because that's the only way he would respond, he turned around laughing, trying to get away. He was doing it for attention and to see what was out in the real world. There's any number of reasons they could do it. I have to tell you, the number of times that Ian's wandered, the first time away from home was the worst time, and the first time out in public was the worst time. Now it's just like, oh, Ian's out, and we go get him. Because we have now figured out where he's going to go, what he's going to do. And the first time you want to address wandering is before you ever, ever, ever have an incident of it. You want to have that, the safety plan in place. You want to have maybe a tracking device on them in case they do wander, because when you get that tracking device, you're not really sure if they're going to. Uh, parents of kids with special needs, whether it's autism, Down syndrome, intellectual disability, whatever it might be, those who have a propensity to wander, 40% of you guys are experiencing sleep deprivation, am I right? Yeah, <laughs> you are afraid to fall, asleep, fall into deep sleep because you don't know when your child's gonna wander away. So, yeah, we experience a lot of sleep deprivation. Um, it's a big concern, eloping. The difference between that, eloping and bolting or fleeing is the fast getaway, I gotta get out of Dodge because something's going on. Wandering is that very slow kind of meandering. Maybe you tell a kid to throw something away in the classroom and they get up and they go all, to all corners of the classroom before they actually get to the garbage can. That's wandering. Eloping is the fast getaway. So eloping, bolting, fleeing, those types of things. Um, in a school, the biggest place that kids will wander or elope, most likely elope from, is the cafeteria. Lots of smells from the foods commingling. It's very, um, the acoustics are incredible. It's very echoey. Um, 
lots of different noises. There's usually fluorescent lights that are flickering and they're buzzing. So there's a sensory overload situation at the, at the cafeteria. So that is one of the biggest places that we see issues of elopement happening. Goal-directed wandering. This is what my son engaged in for years and I wasn't aware of what it was until I went to work for CARD. And he would purposely go out of the house, go to the car to get his toy that he left in there. Now, he'd open the door and he'd just walk out. That's also called purposeful or goal-directed wandering. There was a reason behind it. So there's always a reason behind it, but it was a very specific reason. He was going to the car to get his toy. And if the car was not unlocked, he would bang on the car door or the window until I heard it and went out and opened the car for him. Um, other times he would go out and if the car was open, he'd get his toy, come back in. The car door's open, the front door's open. My kid's back in his room and I'm going through that whole process that I have to find my wandering child. But he's back in his room already. So having these locks and things in place are important. There's other types of wandering too. The nighttime wandering is a lot of confusion um, that mingles with that. So when they wake up, they're maybe not quite awake and they'll wander out of the house. We had an incident of that four years ago in St. Lucie County. A little girl got up, she wandered out the door. Dad was seconds behind her, but he, it was very dark in the area that they lived. She went one way, he went the other. And she was recovered the next, uh, two days later, she was recovered out of a pond as a result of drowning from her wandering. 49% um, of kids with autism, other developmental disabilities, but this is uh, geared tar uh, targeting primarily kids with autism. 49% of them will attempt to wander or elope. As you can see, 20, uh, 2009 to 11, 91% of the deaths of US kids between 14 and younger were accidental drownings. A third of the kids who wander are not able to verbalize their name and their address and maybe a phone number. And they're eight times more likely to wander than their same age peers. This is just a list of statistics from the National Autism Association. They are the primary autism association that uh, deals with a lot with wandering. That is like their primary focus. Safety, wandering, and elopement is big with them. They have a Big Red Safety Toolkit. Sometimes they just had a grant drop down and they've got safety kits available that you can order and have it shipped to your home. They also now have them available for the classrooms. So wandering elopement, like any behavior, has a purpose or a function behind it. It could be for attention. And you think about attention for wandering and elopement. Hmm. Well, think about what you do when your child wanders or elopes. You're gonna scoop them up, squeeze them tight, tell them how much you love them and that you're so glad to see them. Well, you just gave them attention for wandering. Um, then, once the, the adrenaline drops out and you're, you're done with the whole, okay, he's back, he's, the relief is worn off, now you're angry because your child scared you so badly. So now you might reprimand them verbally, again, still getting attention. And like my son, the first time he wandered, he wanted to be chased, so we chase them. We have to. So that's, you're between a rock and a hard place with wandering and elopement. You have to chase them down because it's a safety issue, but you're also giving them attention. So we're reinforcing a behavior we don't wanna see. But again, it's a safety issue. You have to address it. Could be to get something they wanted. My son's purposeful or goal-directed wandering was to get his toy out of the car. So that was to get something tangible. Escape or avoid, I gave you an example of escape or avoid. Escape is when they're already in the situation and they leave. Avoidance is when they're like, think of it this way, they put their hands on the door jam and there's no way they're going in, they're pushing to, get a, to stay away from the area. That's avoidance. So escape, avoidance kind of goes together because they want to be away from that environment. And then, just for fun, um, back up here. Um, just for fun, walking, sight, just a minute, sightseeing. Um, average walking speed is three miles an hour. So in 10 minutes, they could be a half a mile away. In 20 minutes, they can be a mile away. In an hour, they can be three miles away. So you think about that. However, 
Statistics from National Autism Association shows the primary number of kids who are, re who are recovered are found about a half a mile from their home, or a quarter, quarter to a half a mile. And that little girl I referred to in Port St. Lucie about four years ago, she was three-tenths of a mile from her home when she was found in the pond. So definitely want to check water first, always. Because even if they're not in the water when you get there, they may be skirting it, walking around it, looking at it. And why are kids with autism so drawn to water? Lots of reasons. Well, there's three or four that I can think of. Sensory. It's beautiful to watch the sun or the moonlight shimmer on the water. It acts like a mirror. They can see themselves in it. They can make silly faces like my son would do. And then the, just the calming effect of the water on their skin. So definitely sensory issues that pertain to them being drawn to water. Yeah, absolutely. And when I would get them, I would never say anything. I would just hand them back, put them back down. Maybe I would say something like, here's your seat. But very matter-of-factly, not like, here's your seat. Right. Yeah, you don't, yeah, if they wander away, if there's a way to radio somebody to block them, that way you're not necessarily chasing them. You can have someone ahead of them stop them and redirect them back to the classroom or back to wherever it is that they were wandering from. So there's different layers of support that we encourage from FAU CARD, and that is obviously close supervision. But eventually, we all have to go to the bathroom. And these kids only need 10 seconds to figure out how to get out the door. So close supervision is absolutely the best, but we're all human, and eventually that's going to fall apart on us too. Swimming lessons. I did talk a little bit about if your kids could swim. I never discourage sw swimming lessons. Absolutely get your kids swimming lessons. But again, sometimes the special needs swim instructors, depending on the child's behavior, I know with my son, they only taught him to get to the side of the pool. What's the problem with that? There's no side of the pool in a canal. So it works, but it doesn't work. If you're 100% sure that your child's only ever going to go into a pool, then maybe that's okay. But we can't be sure of that. Just like we can't be sure that they're never, ever going to wander or elope. So I don't discourage swim lessons, but I do encourage other layers of support in conjunction with swim lessons. You can do some environmental modifications of your home. You could put locks on. You could put the alarm chimes and things like that on. I do have a story about alarm chimes. As you'll find out, I have a lot of stories. Um, my son was 10, and I had the alarm system on. I had the chime set up so that I would hear the door when it opened. That worked great until one day when I decided I was going to vacuum my floor, and I had my back to the bedroom door where he was at and the ba my back to the front door, and the vacuum on, I didn't hear the chime. I didn't see his little body slip past me, and I shut the, the vacuum off. I turn around, and my front door is wide open, and my kid's gone. So, this is when I found out he liked doorbells. He was next door ringing the lady's doorbell. And lucky for me, that was a nice segue into introducing them to my son, because they had just returned from their uh, snowbirds. They just returned, so I was able to introduce my son to them. But yeah, the chime works great from the alarm system, but again, if nothing else is going on, that's going to be louder than the chime going off. There's other environmental modifications that I did personally. Um, you obviously are going to have to find what works for your family. I put at the very top of my door the hasp with the thing that flips over and you can put the padlock in. I never locked the padlock. I just had it slipped in there. And bef prior to us moving, he just got tall enough where his middle finger could touch the bottom of the lock, but never tall enough where he could take the lock out. So it worked. So he was never able to get out the door. So we did extinguish a little bit of that because he found out that it wasn't going to work him trying to get out the door. So you'll have to find what works best for you. There are people in this field that are, that's what their life work is, is to find environmental modifications that work for families with kids with autism. Community education. You can go around, like I said, I informed the neighbors next door that my son had autism, and if he's outside, you need to let me know, because he's got autism, and he can't speak, and he doesn't go outside without an adult with him, or a sister. So you want to do that 
with your neighbors. However, I suggest you make that your well-known trusted neighbors and not just everybody on the street. And prior to doing that, make sure you do a predator search because we don't want to inadvertently give somebody information they don't need. So definitely inform your well-trusted known neighbors, but do that predator search just to make sure you know who's in your neighborhood before you go out and do something like that. Different identification options are available, and we're going to go through some, of what, uh, some slides of what those look like. And then skill development. Teaching your kids to respond to the word no. Stop. Giving them a functional way to ask to go outside. Maybe they just want to go out in the backyard uh, and swing, but they don't have a way to ask you that, so they just go out the front door because that's the only access they have to the outside. So definitely working with your BCBA and even a speech pathologist if you're working on communication skills because we want to make sure our kids have functional communication training, some sort of functional communication so they can ask for what they need. That could be something as simple as pictures by the back door. They give you, I want to go outside, I want to go in the pool, I want to swing, whatever it might be. And then there's the locating technologies. So there are different tools for informing others that you have a child with autism, whether it's in your car or the items around your house. Uh, there's magnets, the car magnets, the ribbon magnets, you've seen all of those around. Um, there's alert decals. You can even get the license plate. And then for your home, there's some of the same stickers, magnets on your front door, refrigerator, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know how many of you are old enough or had family members that used the um, vial of life. That was an old program that the elderly people would put all their medical information and would put it in the refrigerator. Well, in this case, I would use a magnet, an autism ribbon magnet, something like that, to indicate autism, and put that safety handout that we're going to talk about, put that in your refrigerator. It'll be there for the first responders if they ever have to be called and show up because your child wandered. It'll be there for the babysitter. Be there for grandma if she doesn't quite have all the numbers and all the information she needs when she's staying with your child. Good information to have, and I do recommend updating it. Uh, these are some of the familiar decals and symbols that you can get. Um, the autism awareness magnet is also a decal for your windows if you don't want to put a magnet on your paint. Um, different alert, emergency alert symbols that could go in your car, suction cupped or the window clings for your window. And then the card center that I work for, we have FAU card magnets that we give our families when we have them in stock. We want to make sure that our kids are identified in some way, shape, or form, especially if they're nonverbal. It's important that they have a way to identify themselves. So they could also just be an individual who's got a language impairment, and they can talk, but they're not comfortable answering questions of unf to unfamiliar people. So um, the language impairment might prevent them being able to uh, successfully communicating who they are, where they live, that sort of thing, and they might just be afraid to talk to somebody they don't know. I do recommend to uh, families that they're 12 and up kids, they get their state ID cards. These are medical alert bracelets. I specifically like the one with the USB. You can put all their medical information in there, all your contact information. So if they're wearing that and they wander away and law enforcement picks them up, they're all equipped with computers in their cars. They can plug that in and find out who they're dealing with here. Who's this little child? Where they come from? And they, they'll find out instantly that it's not just a neglect issue here. We've got a child with autism with a, you know, a real viable reason for why they're away from the home. It's not the parent's fault. Absolutely. And I'm getting to that. Absolutely. So you can teach them to hand them this. Or if, they're, um, if they get the state ID card, if an officer says, where do you live? There's a whole issue about that, too. Um, runner shoe tags for those kids that don't want to wear anything could be on their shoe um, if they're a child who doesn't kick their shoes off. Uh, we, for my son, it had to be on his left shoe because that right shoe was coming off every single day. So it had to be on his left shoe. Um, something that my daughter and I just did, um, we'll get to that in a minute. So there's different cards that they can be taught to hand over. Um, the state ID card now has a special designation. The black D here, you can have for an extra dollar fee, they will put the black D on the bottom right-hand corner, just like they would organ donor, put that on your, on your child's 
uh, state ID card to indicate that they have a developmental disability. And then there's certain information that you're supposed to provide to the DMV, and then they scan it into their computer system. So if an officer scans, runs the person, then they can figure out that they have autism and whatever information is put in there. Now, the diagnosis, that sort of thing. The parents do this. The parents, when they take their child at 12, 13, 14, whenever it is, I recommend 12, um, to the DMV to get their state identification card, then they can ask for that D to be added on for the dollar fee extra, and they provide them with the information they need to prove that this child has a... You still want to have something to scan into the system, because, so the officers, yes, yes. The dollar goes to APD, by the way. Yes. So when they have the ID or they have the little card, they've got all their pertinent information on there. In the classrooms, when they're teenagers and adult, in middle school or high school, they're often taught to answer their questions, where do you live? I live in an apartment. I live in a house. I live with my mom. What they're taught is, this is your address. What is your address? My address is 9331 Southeast Randall Court. When an officer says, where do you live, they're asking for your address. And we've had some kids get in some trouble, and I got this directly from law enforcement officers through crisis intervention team training, as they think they're being little smart alex. I, I altered my language there. They think they're being smart alex, because they're answering the question exactly the way they were taught. Where do you live? I live in a house with my mom. I live with my cat. That's how they were taught to answer it from this high up. So we have to tr change the way that we're teaching them to l help them understand that even if you're asked where do you live, you can hand them your ID card. It's got your name, your address, they can scan it and uh, all their emergency information is in there so that they can contact your parent. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, with cell phones now, you could have a different area code. So you can't just assume 5612397 is going to get you to FAU. It might get you someplace else at a different area code. It's the runner ID, the ones that the runners use. No, this one does not store information. Yes, but there is a ver version of this that I did see with Medical Alert that you can put on a shoe that is connected, it's got a, a number that's connected to the USB stuff that's all in their computer system. These, no, but there's other systems that you can use. Wouldn't that be great? You know, mother of invention is, is or the necessity is the mother of invention, so there you go. All right, so some other types that you can use. Um, Non-permanent tattoos, those are great for the classrooms when you're going out on those field trips or all everybody having the same color shirts, things like that. Clothing tags, this is something new. Yes, my son's 28, we're just now addressing clothing tags. I've been writing his name in all of his clothes because he's with the group home. But now we're getting tags that we're adding to his clothing. And you know the kids all have sensory issues. Hanes was the first company to come out with tagless shirts. Great invention, love it. It was a godsend for my son because he hated the tags. So what I'm doing with his tags is bottom left corner of his shirt, that's where they're being ironed. Instead of the neck, where it's going to irritate him, they're going here. He doesn't tuck his shirts in, so hanging over his pants or his shorts is going to address that sensory issue. And then with his pants, not much you can do there, but his pull-up or his underwear, whatever they wear, will take into consideration something in their waistband because pull-ups and underwear generally pull up a little higher than their, their pants when they're put on correctly. Um, so those are some of the different options that are available. Uh, my daughter got our tags from Etsy. They were like $6 for 100 so they're very inexpensive to get these days. And you could probably make them yourself. Um, Staples does have ones that you can use your printer for, print the information on them. I just didn't know how they would hold up in the laundry, so I didn't really go that route. Alert Me Bands, first place I heard about these was on Facebook. 
They were, on, they were $9.99 to start. It's kind of canvassy. It kind of looks kid-friendly, so even the younger ones could use those. Um, you could put anything on there you want. You customize it. It could, be, it could say Asperger syndrome, Down syndrome, autism, seizure disorder, language impairment, nonverbal, whatever it is that you need to put on there, you could put on there. You could even put wandering risk on it so that people that are seeing him, like the teachers will know if you haven't had that conversation yet, but I hope you have. Um, Medipal, something for the car, or you could attach it to their backpack. This has got Velcro, the red strip there is Velcro, so you can fold it in thirds and it can go around the, the seat belt and the spot that they sit, or um, the car seat strap, or it could go on their backpack. On the back of it, there is an elastic strap that you could put on the visor, my recommendation is if your child sits in the back seat behind you, then I would put it on the headrest directly in front of where they sit so that first responders know it's for that person, either the, the driver or the passenger. Once they open it and see the date of birth, they'll see that it's for the child. You could also add a picture where it says logo. And I believe there's a spot inside for a picture, but my suggestion is you put it here. That way they know exactly who this Medipal is for. This is some information about Project Lifesaver. They're the leader in the tracking device programs. Sound okay? Project Lifesaver was implemented in 2002 at the Lynchburg Sheriff's Office. We wanted to offer this to the citizens of Lynchburg to give the caregivers and family members uh, peace of mind that their loved one can be found quickly. Well, I was a police officer in Chesapeake, Virginia for 33 years. One of my jobs was a commanding officer of special operations, which was SWAT and search and rescue. We were having a lot of uh, recurring searches for Alzheimer's patients that had wandered, and frankly, we weren't doing a very good job of finding them. And I really was getting uh, a little tired and disheartened about having to tell families that we were discontinuing the search or worse, that we had found them, however. Project Lifesaver, number one, is a tool to help public safety personnel locate people that have a condition that would cause them to wander. Uh, it's not just equipment. That's the big thing. It, it's not, we're not just a vendor or something. Uh, we're a program. We have had 92 successful searches. It's a great feeling. It's a great peace of mind for families and citizens of Lynchburg. Uh, we enjoy getting to know the families and building rapports with them. Uh, so it really hits home when one wanders. I mean, you know, you know more about them. You have a bond with the family and the child or the adult. My fervent hope was to be able to find something that would help us in uh, making these searches more successful. Came across some information about wildlife tracking. And the thought occurred to me, if we can do this with wildlife, why can't we do it with people? So I was able to contact a company, get them to work with me, uh, and develop a transmitter that could be put on a person's arm. And that was the start of Project Lifesaver. Our passion, our desire, uh, we, we think Project Lifesaver, the Lynchburg Project Lifesaver program is uh, our premier community service program here in the city of Lynchburg. Uh, we provide it now at no cost to those that cannot afford it through an annual fundraiser. And so, but again, the goal behind that is, is when we bring that individual back home safely, and historically with our 92 all within 30 minutes or less. Um, the emotion that we feel, the, the satisfaction that we have done our job and done it well with the assistance of this technology, you can't put a price on that because someone's life, someone's loved one is brought home 
and um, it makes a difference. I tell people when you work for Project Lifesaver International, it's not a job, it's a way of life and you adapt yourself to it. I used to describe it and still do as when you're searching for somebody and you don't have anything like this to help you, you are actually doing a swag search. And people say, well, what's a swag? I said, it's a scientific wild ass guess. Before Project Lifesaver, you didn't have any resources but individuals. When we first started the program, I mean, it was very bare basics. You know, we had the receiver, we had the transmitter, uh, and they were pretty uh, bear. I mean, it was just a, it was a, something that had never been done before. So we were doing what we could with what we had. Uh, then you had tracking equipment that could assist with you, um, assist with the search, narrow it down, make it a little faster, give that extra peace of mind to caregivers. Of course, when Project Lifesaver came to Lynchburg Sheriff's Office, and we had basic uh, receivers that we used. In fact, at first rescue, we used those receivers and saved a 92-year-old lady that had wandered from a nursing home. Uh, and using that equipment, she was located in eight minutes, and she would not have made it until morning. It was in December, and all she had on was a house coat. I kept feeling, well, we, we need to be stepping ahead. We need to improve all the time. We need to make it easier for the agencies, easier for the people, give them more, more that they can work with. Then you're actually able to extend that through air searches, which was wonderful. But the availability of getting a helicopter in a timely manner and getting some of one available to fly the helicopter, you're having to depend on other people and other departments and other resources. Helicopters are great. I love them. However, they're expensive. And when you need them, sometimes you can't get them. Maintenance issues, weather issues, crew issues. And even if you can get it, you're 30 to 45 minutes and sometimes an hour away from it arriving on scene. Where with the drone, if you had that, you could just implement the search right there. You don't have to depend on getting an outside agency to come in and start your search. Here's something you can have in the trunk of the car. And it gives you what a helicopter would give you, and it gives it to you much quicker, much cheaper. Okay, we're going to stop that there. Um, they do find the little boy, but this is a contrived situation just for training purposes. Uh, but Gene Saunders, Chief Saunders, just um, emailed or posted on his Facebook page that they just did a search and rescue and found someone within three minutes of with using the Project Lifesaver stuff. So it does work. So the emergency contact form, you want to carry it all the time, um, have a copy with you, um, have a copy at home, um, have a copy for the teacher so that it can go on field trips, and maybe even if you've got a, your child on a special needs bus, um, you have one for the, the um, bus driver. So you want to make sure that you have one of those completed before you ever have interaction with law enforcement, because all the pertinent information that they're going to ask is going to be on that emergency handout form or the contact form. It's especially useful if you're going out of town. And if you do have a Project Lifesaver tracking device for your child, then you can go on the Project Lifesaver International website and they'll have posting or they'll have information listed. You could actually enter all the cities that you're going to be in and they'll tell you where the nearest uh, law enforcement agency is that has the hardware to track the individuals. So you can use that as part of your planning if you have a child that has one of the tracking devices. Um, again, very useful for babysitters and respite workers having it available at home. Again, I recommend on the refrigerator with maybe one of the autism magnets or something like that. So what kind of information do you put on it? Obviously their, their name and a current photograph. Now, I recommend changing the photo for little kids at least twice a year, every six months. Maybe more often as they get older, but for older kids, probably you know, 12 and up, 
maybe once a year on their birthday, something like that. Update the form, update the picture, that sort of thing. And make sure you're updating it in all those places. You want to have all the caregiver contact information, caregiver or guardian, if it's someone who's an adult that has the propensity to wander, um, any sensory, um, medical, or dietary information. Why do you need dietary information on there for a wandering situation or an elopement situation? Well, law enforcement officers like to give our kids food. Helps calm them down. So we want to make sure that the information is available to them so they're not giving them something they might be allergic to. So this is information that you want to, if you have a 911 regist special needs registry in your area, this is information you want them to have. So if they do have to do, um, they do retrieve your child from a wandering or elopement situation, then they will have all this information that they need. Um, any previous elopement wandering behavior, where did they go? Where were they found? Also, you want to list any challenging behaviors they might have. For my son, he tends to put his hand against his face like this, and he screams into his hands just prior to him pulling your hair. So, you know, if this is coming, you want to tuck and roll and get out of his way because um, he can pull hair. He's a champ at that. Uh, and any other unique characteristics about them that would help them be easily identified. The challenging behaviors, you also want to give them, list some ways that you can distract them so that you can kind of pull them out of that challenging behavior. Like I mentioned earlier, my friend's son with the Miami Dolphins. You want to include information on their favorite attractions um, or locations. Maybe there's a park in the area and they particularly like the jungle gym in that park. Uh, you want to list if there's a McDonald's nearby and they like McDonald's chicken nuggets. Anything like that that they want, that they might want to go to. You also are going to want to list their likes and dislikes. Their dislikes are important. You wouldn't think that that's important information. However, it is very important information because that's ru that rules out places you have to look. So if they don't like busy places, you're probably not going to find them at the Walmart unless they like pretzels, like my son. And then you also want to put on there some approach or de-escalation techniques, like the distraction technique my, my friend uses with his son. Um, mode of communication. Are they verbal? Are they nonverbal? Uh, do they speak well? Are they conversational? Do they just speak enough to get their needs met? Are they using picture exchange? Can they text? Can they read? Things like that. Because if they're, they have the ability to spell things out, then you could you know, give them something to write or give them a phone to type out a message on. Not necessarily to be sent, but at least the law enforcement officer would know who they were if they were able to type their name. This is one form of the emergency contact. I don't like this one. I don't think there's enough information on it. And I'm looking at this from a parent's perspective, um, and there's not enough information, not enough room to put information on this. This is a wandering plan from the National Autism Association. Um, it's important to have in conjunction with your, your emergency contact form. This is the alert form that I like. This has got a lot of room for information. There's a spot for a picture, as you can see. Physical description is there, uh, but there's lots of room to write down what their likes or dislikes are, and also areas that they've been found in the past if they've engaged in wandering or elopement behavior. There's also a place where you can write out a physical description of them as well. Then, contacting 911. If your child wanders or elopes from your home, I had a sergeant with St. Lucie County Sheriff's Department tell me, the first thing we want you to do is call 911 because we would rather you call us back and say, I found him in a closet, than for you to wait an hour, and then we are, turn a search and rescue into a recovery mission. So always call 911. That's what they're there for. There's no problem with them responding. You want to do that before you go out to look. My suggestion is if both parents are there or you've got an older sibling, somebody stays home, because you call law enforcement, your home address that you give them, that's where they're going to roll up. That's where the scene is. So that you need to have somebody there to interact with them. And then if, you, you know, if your husband wants to go out and search or your wife wants to go out and search, then they can go do that. But somebody should stay at the home or the place that you last saw your child where you called 911 to. Um, wandering and elopement behavior is pretty prominent in kids with autism or young adults with autism, as well as individuals with Alzheimer's disorder. Um, and in intellectual disabilities, Down syndrome, um, those are the primary 
kid, the, the diagnosis of the kids who primarily wander. Um, also want to disclose if the individuals might have a seizure disorder. That's important information too because we want to find them before they maybe possibly fall into water and if they're controlled with medication, we want to get them back so that their next dose is not missed. You want to always call 911 and they'll alert their officers to roll onto the scene, but you also want to stay on the phone with them. And then that emergency handout is a great opportunity for you to read the information off that to them if they don't have it with their 911 system. And that helps keep us moms focused, as I've been a basket case when I've, my son has wandered. And that's just how it is. I'm a professional in the field, but I'm my mom first. So I, I have one of those for Ian when he lived at my home, and now the group home is supposed to have one. And we update that every year with his support plan. So that's updated as well. So updating them once a year for older kids, updating them at least twice a year for younger kids because you want to update their picture, they're going to change as they grow. And making sure that all that information is available. Um, you want to make sure that form is someplace you can put your hands on it. That's why I suggest the refrigerator. That's where we put all of our kids' artwork. Um, any notes we want our husband to see or our wife to see. Um, places like that. Um, you want that information available so that you have a better response time by law enforcement. And when the officer rolls up on scene, he's already got a lot of this information. But as a mom, I know I wouldn't be able to answer questions, and I wasn't when I had to call 911 for a seizure emergency. And they had the Ian, the, I had a child with autism and a seizure disorder at my home, so that's pretty much all the information they needed to get there. But you could also just hand that to them when they get to the scene because you're not able to really coherently speak to them because I wasn't. I know that firsthand. So. Um, you want, again, posting the copies nearby the, well, I say near a phone, but who has a phone anymore that uh, is stationary? We all have cell phones pretty much. So the refrigerator, um, those sorts of places. Again, call 911 before you go to search. Make sure someone is there where you called 911 to respond to. And check with your local 911, your county, your sheriff, or your local PD to see if they have a special needs registry. I know Jupiter Police does. They have a special needs registry. And I know in St. Lucie County, they can tag your address that you have a special needs individual living at the home. Um, but in St. Lucie County, we also have the Project Lifesaver tracking devices available at no charge to the families. And when the deputy goes out to, give the to assign the bracelet, she also does an autism response um, form her alert form basically. So she does a cursory look over the neighborhood and notes any bodies of water, um, what kind of environmental modifications have been made to the home, those sorts of things. The first responder checklist, if you read through this, it's exactly the same information that is on that handout that you want to have available, the contact form. Um, so these are the same, this is things that the first responders are being trained on to ask. Everybody got that picture? I think there's a second page to it. Okay, no. There is one more video I wanted to show you. And this is about autism and wandering. It's from the National Autism Association. As I said, they are the uh, primary leading agency in wandering and elopement education. An autistic boy who disappeared this morning has been found dead in a swimming pool. An autistic girl drowning during a party. Holding out hope that little John Burton Jr. had just been hiding. Where her body was found just a couple hours ago. An autistic boy wanders away from home and dies. Each week we update our missing persons list. We update any uh, casualties. And this week we did have a little boy 
who was killed by a train, 12 years old. I just tried to go along the shore and I went deep. I thought maybe I had her at one point. And then there are the stories where our children beat the odds. I'll cry at a football game. So if you keep asking questions like that, I'll tear up here. There's a lot of emotion with this. There you see Nadia right there as she's being carried out. What a, what a wonderful and happy ending to this. At NAA, we do tend to focus more on the severe side of autism. I know. I know, you're very frustrated. Our autism is seizures, head banging, insomnia, crippling bowel disease, debilitating fear, overwhelming sensory dysfunction, pica, and self-injury. It defines human beings, young and old, who are severely impacted, and the families who live in constant prevention and survival mode. National Autism Association is a parent-run organization. This issue hits home for us. My son has wandered from multiple school settings. Our president at NAA, Wendy Fournier, her daughter is an active wanderer. We know how hard it is to keep our kids safe. There's a huge lack of resources. It's why NAA has created safety initiatives like the Big Red Safety Box, our FOUND program, the AWARE collaboration, and AutismSafety.org. Autism parents are strong. We're very dedicated. <laughs> yeah, Scooby Doo. All right. Good job. Uh, okay. What? I don't know what that means. This means something. Get out. Wait, I'll do a little bit more. Come on. Wow. Let me do the top part. You know, there's so little resources for these families and what do you do when you live next to a pond and your child is constantly trying to get to the pond? We tell first responders to search water first. Uh, a lot of times our kids will not respond to verbal commands. They won't respond to their name. They won't respond to stop. So you have to just get in there and get them. Stay there, stay there, Ryan, stay there. Stay there, stay there. You look at Ryan's story, you look at the video, you see a happy ending. You also have to look at that video and imagine if that person wasn't there with Ryan. Listen to Ryan's cries and know there are so many children who have died this way without even the ability to cry out for help. We have to learn from those children, honor their stories, make sure that it doesn't happen to other children. These deaths are preventable. So I don't know how many people have looked at us as parents and just think you could do a better job of parenting your child because they're having a meltdown in Walmart or wherever they're having a meltdown. Well, I'm here to tell you as a parent myself, it's not our fault. So if you were thinking that with this, all this wandering information, it wasn't that mom's fault that Ryan got away. So take that away if you take nothing else away today. And also projectlifesaverinternational.org. Um, one other thing, there are other devices, uh, the GPS devices. Um, at CARD, we don't discourage you from getting a GPS device. But just know, if the signal to the satellite is blocked, so is the signal to your phone from that device. The uh, tracking devices from Project Lifesaver or even Safety Net are done through radio frequency. So they can pick those up a lot easier. They're not as, they're not, they wouldn't be blocked like the GPS signal. Think about satellite radio in your car. If you drive under an overpass, it blocks out. You're in a bunch of trees, it blocks out. 
So the same thing is going to happen with your gyro bit or your angel sense or things like that. So uh, thank you all. Anybody have any questions other than we've, what we've already answered? Okay. Thanks, everybody, for attending today. Uh, my contact information, the phone number in the program is not my phone number. I don't know where they got that one. But my email is C-A-L-L-O-R-E at F-A-U dot E-D-U, and that is correct in the book. Thank you. <laughs>